about 588 BC, it was the 10th, 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. The king of Babylon came and besieged Judah. He took it as captive. And in that year, the king took Jeremiah and threw him in prison because Jeremiah had prophesied that destruction will come, that the captivity will come. And while he's in prison, the Lord speaks to him and he tells him, look, your cousin is going to come and he's going to offer you a piece of land. To sell you a piece of land, you buy it. Get witnesses and buy it. So Jeremiah gets witnesses, buys the land, and then he offers up a prayer, a beautiful prayer. And in his prayer, he presents two problems to God. How many problems? Two problems to God. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 32. In Jeremiah chapter 32, and Jeremiah's prayer starts in verse 17. And Jeremiah starts praying and saying, O Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Now Jeremiah is telling the Lord there is nothing too hard for thee and then he's about to present a problem. That means in Jeremiah's mind he has a problem in that he's, he's telling God look there is nothing too hard for thee but there is a problem in here that you haven't solved yet. Let's carry on reading. In verse 18 he says thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompenses the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them, the great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great in counsel and might in work, for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even unto this day, and in Israel and among other men, and has made thee a name, as at this day. And then he presents something now to the Lord. He says, And has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders and with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm and with great terror and has given them this land which thou didst swear to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came in and possessed it. What did Jeremiah just do? He recited to the Lord the great power, the miracles that God did to bring Israel out of Egypt. He said, you, you released them from Egypt. You brought them out of the bondage of Egypt. And you made them enter this land, the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. But they obeyed not thy voice, neither walked in thy, way, in thy law. They have done nothing of all that thou commandest them to do. Therefore, thou hast caused all this evil to come upon them. I see Jeremiah in here presenting a problem to the Lord. He's saying, Lord, you brought Israel out of Egypt. You, you, you took them out of the bondage of Egypt and you made them enter into the promised land. But there is still a problem. They were not able to do anything you commanded them to do. They were freed from Egypt, but they are still not totally free. Why? They're going back into captivity now. Why? This is problem number one. I see Jeremiah presenting to the Lord. And then he goes on praying, Behold the mountains, they are come unto the, the city to make it. And the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans that fight against it because of the sword and of the famine and of the pestilence and what thou hast spoken is come to pass and behold thou seest it and thou hast said unto me O Lord God buy thee the, the field for money and take witnesses for the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans and then he presents another problem which is a small problem and he says and, and these Babylonians are coming to take over this land and, and, and it's Already taken over and then you're asking me to buy a piece of land. Why? Now God answers both problems to Jeremiah. I just want to take the second problem out of the way. In the last verse of Jeremiah 32, the last sentence of the last verse, he says, God said, for I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. God answers both problems, but I just want us to deal with the first problem first. 
the second problem, sorry, first, he tells him, look, don't worry about buying the land because I will bring them back and they will possess this land again. So that's not a problem. But there's still the first problem that Jeremiah presented to God. God had intended to free Israel. He brought them out of bondage, out of Egypt, and He made them enter the promised land, but they're still not free. Are you catching on what I'm saying? They were not able to do anything the Lord asked them to do, and Jeremiah just confused. He's saying, Lord, there's nothing too hard for thee. But how come your people are not able to do anything you ask them to do? Why, Lord? <clears throat> Before we look at uh, God's answer to Jeremiah, I want us to go back to the time of Exodus when God brought Israel out of Egypt to see if God points out what the problem is. Did God know that there is a problem? And if so, what was it? Remember when, when, when God brought Israel to Mount Sinai? God spoke to all Israel, to all the people. And then the people, when God stopped speaking, ran to Moses and they said, Look, you go speak to God because we're scared lest we die. You go talk to him and whatever he said, you come and tell us. And then they added what? For all what the Lord, all what the Lord says, we will do. Let's pick up the story in the record that is written for us of this story in Deuteronomy, not in Exodus. I quote it from Exodus, but I want us to look at Deuteronomy. Because I believe God brings out something in here, Moses records it, that is detrimental, is very important, that had plagued Israel and is plaguing Christianity today. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting at verse 27. The people in here, Israel, they're telling Moses, Go thou near, and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us, all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words, Moses speaking now, when you spake unto me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of, his, of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. And then I see God crying, weeping in the words that are to come. He says, Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. God brought Israel out of Egypt. They're outwardly free now. They reached Mount Sinai. God gave them the commandments. But God still sees a problem. And it's almost like he's weeping and saying, Oh, if these people would have a heart in them, that would, they would obey me and do my commandments. Can you see that? You see, Israel just came out of bondage. They thought that when they leave Egypt, they will be free. They thought that when they leave Egypt, they'll be free to do whatever they want to do. They'll be okay. And they came to God, to Mount Sinai, thinking that they are okay, and they were prepared to make a covenant with God, and they said, all what the Lord has said, we will do. You see, you see I, I see it this way. Most of the Israelites that were out there, if not all of them, at Mount Sinai were born in captivity. They were born and bred as slaves. They had come to believe that their problem was only Egypt and the Egyptians. Their problem was an outward one. And they believed that if they can be released from this outward problem, they will be fine. They will be okay. They can stand before God. So they came to God and they're ready to strike a deal with Him. But these people, while they're in Egypt, they only saw their outer problem and they saw the solution to their outer problem in God and in His servant Moses. So they followed Him 
and they went outside. But these people had failed to understand and realize how wicked and vile and sinful their hearts were. They focused so much on their outward problem, the Egyptian, that they had forgotten or they missed their inward problem. Can you see that? Yes? yes? We're told they, the Egyptian, had, in Patriarchs and Prophet, had no, no true conception of holiness, of the holiness of God, of the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts, their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God's law and their need of a Savior. The people, when they came out of Egypt, they thought they no longer need a Savior now. They are okay. Because outwardly, they are fine. <clears throat> you see, we see this sentiment, because some of you might be saying, well, where are you getting this from? Why are you saying that Israel thought they are good, they are holy? We see this sentiment coming up in what Korah and the 250 princes a spokesman of all Israel came and told Moses in Numbers chapter 16. If you come with me quickly to Numbers chapter 16, we will see what Israel, all the people thought of themselves once they were outwardly free of Egypt. Numbers chapter 16, and we we'll read verse 3 to save time. It says, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are what? Holy. Are holy. Every one of them. And the Lord is among them. You see, these people thought because now they are outwardly freed from Egypt and because God manifested himself in the camp, they thought that they are now okay to stand before God without a mediator which Moses was. Are you seeing where I'm going? How many of us today think that once we gain the victory over our outward actions, once we can stop smoking or stop drinking or stop swearing or whatever the problem is, how many of us think that once we stop doing that, we'll be ready to stand in the last days? That's what Korah and all Israel fought. And they were destroyed. <clears throat> you see, so many Christians today have only seen their outward problem, the actions that they do. And they see the solution to their action in Jesus. And they accept Jesus and they spend the rest of their life praying that the Lord will give them power to stop smoking or to stop drinking. They focus so much on their outward problem that they have missed the true point of the gospel. They have thought that the gospel is only limited to the outward action. And that's all what they are seeking a solution for. And because of that, they have not attained to the blessing that is found in the covenant. Amen? You see, the Bible tells us that though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, though I give all what I have to the poor, though I have all faith that I can move mountains, and though I have all knowledge, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, what am I? I'm nothing. If the love of God is not shed abroad in your heart and in my heart, we're nothing. Dear brethren, I put to you today that man's real problem is not an outward one. Man's real problem is an inward one. And that is a problem that Israel of old had failed to realize and they did not attain to the blessing of their covenant. And that is the problem that Christians today are facing. And they're failing to recognize how wicked and vile and sinful 
their hearts are and because of that they are failing to attain and to receive the blessings of the new covenant <clears throat> you see because Israel of old thought that they are not that bad that they are okay now because they freed from their outward bondage Egypt they came to God and they said well if I'm not that bad there is some goodness in me you know what I can do something good to please God <clears throat> that's what led them to legalism Christians today because they do not realize that they're wicked they vile on the inside they think that because there is something naturally good in them somehow all what they have to do is develop the good that is in them and then they'll be fine so what does that lead them to? The same thing that that belief led the Jews to. Legalism. Self-righteousness. Self -righteousness. Legalism. <clears throat> you know, when Jesus came to this, to this earth, He faced the same problem with the scribes and the Pharisees. They came to Him and they said, We be Abraham's seed. What is that saying? There is something good in me. <clears throat> Israel of old, they came to Moses and they said, We be holy. All the congregation is holy. The Pharisees and the Jews came to Jesus and they said, We be Abraham's seed. There is something good in us. In Hebrews chapter 8, talking about the old and the new covenant, verse 7 and verse 8 what does it say we all know it right Hebrews chapter 8 verse 7 and verse 8 you all with me anyone sleeping no. are you sure no. do you need to stand up you took what am I saying something wrong no. okay good just making sure you guys are awake Hebrews chapter 8 starting at verse 7 what does it say for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. What is that fault that God found in them? I've always believed that that fault that God found with them, with them is the actions that they did. But I put to you brethren today that the fault that God found with them is a promise that God promised He will do in the new covenant. Amen? Amen? The fault that God found with them is found as a matter of fact in the answer that God gave to Jeremiah when he was praying in jail. Remember, Jeremiah was presenting a problem to the Lord. Lord, you brought Israel out of Egypt. You brought them into the promised land. But they were not able to do what you asked them to do. Why? So God answers his question. And come back to Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. After God finishes the problem, sorry, after Jeremiah finishes the prayer, God tells him that, that uh, uh, Israel, he tells them that they're sinning and all this. But then when you come down to verse 38, talking about the, the, the new covenant that God will make with his people, he points out something. He says in verse 38, And they shall be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. Oh, that there is such a heart in them that they will love me and fear me and obey me always. In the new covenant, God has promised, I will give them one heart that they will love me always. Can you see that? The fault that they had, the Israel had, all mankind had, still have is a natural heart is a carnal heart that's a problem 
that, that, that all mankind have. And in the Old Covenant, these people that made the covenant with, with, with God, they did not realize, they did not understand how wicked and how vile their heart was. All through the Old Testament, you see people trying to earn their salvation. Why? Because they think there is something good in them. This promise as well is found just one chapter earlier, verse, uh, chapter 31 of Jeremiah, verse 33. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. It says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. The fault that God found in them is fulfilled or is given as a promise by God in the new covenant. I will give them one heart. I will give them a new heart. As Ezekiel says it, I will take their stony heart and will give them a heart of flesh. Why? That they may obey me and keep my statues. Amen? Amen. That's why God appealed over and over again to the people, to Israel, in the, under the Old Covenant. You'll see it in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. God is appealing to them, circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. But Israel of old had missed that. You see, Korah and the 250 princes, they thought they can stand before God without a mediator because they were outwardly freed from the bondage of Egypt. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they thought they can stand before God because there is something good in them. And because they kept the law of God outwardly. You see, these people had focused so much on their outward righteousness that they had forgotten their inward unrighteousness. Amen. And because they did not realize their inward unrighteousness, they did not seek for anything more than power to gain a victory over one particular sin. This is the problem I believe that plagued Israel. And how many a Christian today thinks that once they will be freed from outward sins, once they gain the victory over their outward actions, they will be fine, they will be okay to stand before God without a mediator. See, many Christians today think that naturally there is something good in man. And all what man needs to do is develop this good. And he will be fine. And as long as we think that, we will not realize how deep our problem is. And we will not seek for a deeper solution. Amen? The further we get away from it. Amen. Because Christians had focused so much today on their outward righteousness, on the actions, they have missed, just like the Jews, their inward unrighteousness, which Paul calls it in Romans 7, sin that dwelleth in me. Right. Christians have missed that. We think the problem is only outward one. It's only actions. You know, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, what does the verse say? Lie not one another having put off the deeds of the old man? Yes, some people saying yes. Look up the verse and read it for me. Lie not one to another. What does it say? Seeing you have put off how many things? Two things. The old man and his deeds. You see, so many Christians are focusing on the deeds of the old man and they want to find a solution for the deeds of the old man. What about the old man? <laughs> we think the problem is only the fruit that we manifest. What about the root of the fruit? Okay, you with me? You following me? 
Christians today have missed the fact that there is a deeper problem to the fruit. They're trying to gain freedom from the deeds of the old man and they're not realizing that the old man is still there. That the old man is the source of the problem. Teaching the old man to be good. Teaching the old man to be good. You see, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. <clears throat> I've tried to share the gospel with many people. And so many times I hear the same answer coming over and over again from non-Christians and from Christians. Mainly from non-Christians. I'm not that bad. You know, I haven't killed anyone. I haven't stolen. At least this week I haven't. They, they think there is something good in them. And if they can prove to themselves that they are not as bad as their neighbor, they're okay. And what's even worse than a non-Christian not realizing their inward problem is a Christian, a person who accepts Jesus and becomes a Christian without realizing his inward problem. See, Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. Just quickly read it. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 23 verse 27. And Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. But within, ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Did you know that the Bible presents to us two types of righteousness? Paul in, in, in Ephesians chapter 3 tells us what these two types of righteousness are. In Ephesians chapter 3. And we'll just uh, quickly. Sorry, not Ephesians, Philippians chapter 3. We'll just read verse 9. It's nice to read 8 and 9 together, but to save time, we'll read verse 9 of Philippians chapter 3. It says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So we see in this verse in Philippians that Paul is presenting two types of righteousness. One which is of works, of the law and one which is of faith. One righteousness is sin. And one righteousness is true holiness. Every time a Pharisee kept the Sabbath, he was sinning. Every time a Pharisee paid tithes, he was sinning. Every time a Pharisee did something good, he was sinning. Do you know that? Yeah. Amen. You ask me, where do you get that from? Paul presented two types of righteousness. One which is of works and one which is of what? Faith. Of faith. Which righteousness did a Pharisee have? The one of faith? No, of works. What does Paul tell us in Romans 14, 23? Whatsoever which is not of faith is? Every time a Pharisee tried to work to earn his own salvation, he was sinning. Every time a Christian worked to earn his salvation, he's sinning. He's digging a deeper hole for himself. Getting further away. Getting further away. Read one verse as well in Romans chapter 10. Verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not attained to the righteousness of God. Why? Why? few verses earlier in chapter 9 we read because they saw it not by faith. Where did all this stem from? What led the Pharisees to that? It is the belief that I'm not that bad. It's the belief that there is some goodness in me. And if there is some goodness in me, 
I can do something good to please God. The belief that we're not that bad or the lack of understanding of how bad we are led them to a sinful righteousness, if I can call it. Yes? You see, most Christians do not realize that we are carnal, sold under sin. That in me, that is in my flesh, there is nothing good. There is none righteous, no, not one. And the Bible tells us there is none good but God. And unless God is dwelling in our hearts by faith, brothers and sisters, we're no good. We're no good. Somebody might say, well, why? Why should I realize I'm that bad? Why, why, why are you always preaching doom and gloom? Tell me something, brother. Does this voice bring you joy? Does it? It doesn't. But if you are locked up in a stinking dark dungeon, this noise will bring you joy. Amen? Amen? Haven't you heard what Jesus told Simon about the woman? She loved much. Why? Because she's been forgiven much. Dear brethren, until we can recognize, until we can acknowledge and we're convicted that we are ungodly, that we are sinners, that we are the enemies of God, that we are wicked, we cannot appreciate what God has done for us. Amen. We cannot understand the full meaning of the gospel. Right. And by failing to understand how helpless one is, man throughout the ages has sought to please God by doing penances, or by fastings, or by keeping the commandments. Why? Because they have not realized that there is nothing, absolutely nothing they can do to please God. All our righteousness is as filthy rag, the Bible says. There's nothing we can do to please God. You see, the story of the Exodus from Egypt illustrates to us the problem of man. Or rather, the problem that God had to deal with, with, with man. At the Exodus, God had two things to deal with. Right? He had to free Israel out of Egypt. That's one. Which was easy for God to do. And He had to win their hearts. That's number two. This is the problem of man all along. When Adam sinned, God had two things to deal with. God had to deal with, 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 with the sin that Adam did, the legal aspect of the gospel. But God had to win the heart of man back to him. When Adam sinned, Adam introduced something. He introduced a new element in the heart of man that made us enemies of God. The Bible tells us that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Have you looked up the word enemy? It means haters. While we were yet haters of God, Christ died for us. Now, God recognized this problem. God knew that man's problem is not only outward. It is an inward problem. And what can God do? How could God fix this problem? It's easy for God to bring Israel out of Egypt. It's easy for God to give me the power to stop drinking or stop smoking. That's easy to do. That's not hard. But God had a problem. How can he win the heart of somebody that hates him? Right. How can God do that? Will, will giving them land and possession, a land flowing with milk and honey, win their heart? No. Will giving us power to stop that, whatever the sin that we're doing, Win our hearts? What can God do? 
The answer in Greek, it's a one Greek word. It's hilastrion. I don't speak Greek. I'm not a scholar. I can't read Greek. But my, my computer can. And I looked the word up. Just, just so you don't think I'm, I'm, I'm no scholar. But what, what I'm trying to present to you today is that there is another aspect to the gospel. That I believe I missed. I don't know about you. Maybe all of you know it. But I have missed it in the past. I have not seen it in such light. Hilastrian is a Greek word that, that the translators of the Bible found a problem to translate it. Because they could not find one English word that would contain the meaning of this Greek word. This word is translated in Romans chapter 3 verse 25. Any of you have a re revised standard version? I read the translation. It's been translated this way. Whom God put forth as an expiation by His blood. The word expiation. In the King James Version, it's been translated this way. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. What does these two words mean? What does this word, hilastrion, mean? Expiation and propitiation contain two different meanings that are found in the same Greek word. Before I say what the meaning is, did you grasp what the problem God had is? He got Israel out of Egypt. He can give them lands. He can give them the whole world. But He needs to win their heart somehow. Expiation in my understanding, reveals the legal aspect of the gospel. It means to make amends or atone for. To atone for something. To atone for a sin. The Webster, 1828 uh, Webster puts it this way. The act of atoning for a crime by which the guilt is done away and the obligation of the offended person to punish the crime is cancelled. This is the legal aspect of the gospel. This is one meaning of the word. Hilastrian. But that's not all what that word means. You see, if Christ's death was only to atone for a sin, to deal with a legal aspect, then, then the gospel, the good news, is nothing but a legal transaction. The gospel is nothing but to Commit a sin, forgive a sin. The gospel is nothing more than to deal with guilt. To deal with a, with a, with a record of our bad acts in, in the books in heaven. If this is all what the gospel is about, brothers and sisters, we have missed the gospel. Amen? Amen? Now don't get me wrong, there are books in heaven. There is a legal aspect to the gospel. I'm not denying that. But this is not the real deep meaning of the gospel. The other word, propitiation, is the word I believe, or it entails the meaning which God can find a solution to the problem He had when He brought Israel out of Egypt. You see, bringing Israel out of Egypt, out of the outward bondage, clearing our record in heaven, giving us power to overcome our outward sins, doesn't fix the problem. It only deals with the legal aspect. But the problem is still there. We saw that Israel went back into captivity. This other word, or the other meaning of this Greek word, means a means of appeasing. A means of what? Appeasing, or to bring to a state of peace or calm. The Webster, 1828, puts it this way. The act of appeasing wrath and conciliating the favor on of, of an offended person. And I believe it is here where Christians went wrong. We straight away say, yes, of course. God, which I said before, by the way, God had to appease the law. Because the law was broken. It, let's think about what we're saying for a second. I had to think about it for myself because that's what I said. 
Uh, is there a being in heaven walking called the law? What's the law? It's the character of who? Of God. Okay. So, when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, did the heart of God change towards Adam? Does God now have hatred in his heart for Adam? Does God hate the human race? No, we say no, no, no. God loves the sinner, but he hates sin. Amen to that. But the question still needs to be answered. Who needed appeasing? Whose favor needed to be won? God's? Was the propitiation done to bring God closer to us? Yes, there are two parties. Yes, one of them needed appeasing, but it's not God. When Adam sinned, selfishness took the place of love. When Adam sinned, he introduced an element of hatred towards God in his heart. And now the human race hates God. God could easily bring Egypt, uh, uh, Israel out of Egypt. He can easily give us power to overcome sin. He can deal with a legal aspect of the gospel. That's no problem. But the problem is, how could God win your heart, who hates Him, to Him? And I believe the answer is found in this world. In this world. And the way I see it now, is that God <coughs> offered up His Son, Jesus, to appease an angry race. God loved you and me so much that I, I picture him as if he's down on his knees begging you to love him. He offered up his son to please you. He offered up his son to touch your heart somehow that your heart can be one to him. Amen? When I saw it this way, I don't know about you. Maybe you've always seen it this way. Maybe you don't agree, I don't know. But when I saw it this way, it just painted God in a totally different picture Amen. than what I've seen Him before. It, 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 it brought out the love in the gospel more than the legal aspect. I've, I've been studying the sanctuary in the past few, few months. And it, it, it's, look, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. But I got so involved in, in, in the legal aspect of, of things. Now don't get me wrong, there is much more in the sanctuary that I am yet to learn. But it is so easy for us to get bogged down in the legal aspects of the gospel that we miss the heart touching side of the gospel. Amen. The new covenant is built, is based upon better promises than the old. God brought Israel out of Egypt. He gave them the, the, the sacrifices in the sanctuary to point to the death of His Son. Hopefully they will understand what God wanted to do, but they didn't. Now don't get me wrong. Few people in the Old Testament understood, like David. He cried out, Lord, create a clean heart in me. But most of the Israelites, they did not realize how wicked they were, they did not understand the beautiful, the heart-touching aspect of the gospel. And by the death of Christ on the cross, God was on His knees, offering His Son up on the cross, begging you to love Him. There is no mountain too high, there is no valley too deep that God will not cross to save you. Once we accept Jesus... There's a lot more to share, but once we accept Jesus, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, 26, 27, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. By the way, every human being is short of the glory of God. Being justified freely, that word freely there means without a cause. You know, you know how the Bible says about Jesus, they hated me without a cause? Did Jesus give any cause, any reason for the people to hate Him? No, they just hated Him. When you accept Jesus, God justifies you. 
saves you without a cause of your own. There's nothing you can bring to God to help Him save you. Nothing. And unless we realize our inward unrighteousness, we will not, we cannot attain promises of the, co the covenant. Is it a wonder that Jesus said to all the Pharisees that the publicans and the harlots will be in heaven before you? I mean, think about these words. The publicans and the harlots were the scum of the earth at the days of Jesus. Yet Jesus said, they'll be in heaven before you. Why? What is Jesus trying to say? Why will the harlots and, and, and the publicans be in heaven before those who are keeping the law? <clears throat> because they knew who they were. Because they come to realize how wicked and vile they are. Because they have come to understand that there's nothing good in them at all. They have come to realize that they needed a better life. Not a, not, a, not a change of life. Not a patch up of a life. But a new life. Amen. The Bible tells us about Jesus that He is who is our life. We always look at it as, as yes, He is our eternal life. We, we, when He comes, it's more than that. He's our life today. Amen. Being justified by His blood, we shall be saved by His what? His life. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but who? Christ. What is our hope of glory? Christ. There is so much more to share. But I will just close with reading these verses from Romans chapter 3 that I quoted. I think our time is up. In Romans chapter 3, starting from verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness, not yours, His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You're justified by faith in Jesus. You're saved by His life. It's not of the works of the law. Just so nobody misunderstands what I'm saying. Am I doing away with the law? No. God forbid. When we have the righteousness of God, when we receive the righteousness which is of faith, it will work in us to do the will of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. But it, if you can get just two things from this talk, which I was just hoping to, to relate two things to you. I don't know how good I relate them. But only two things I want to relate to you. Number one, there is nothing good in you. You can do nothing to please God. Stop trying because regardless of what you do, you cannot please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The second thing I want us to understand is that the gospel is not just a legal transaction. God needed to touch your heart and my heart. God needed to change your heart, your life, somehow. And He can only do it in a supernatural way. Amen. By doing something that will touch the heart of the human race. Amen? Amen. Anyway, let us pray and we'll leave it at that. Our loving Father in heaven, dear Lord, what a, what a joy it is. What a glorious gospel it is, dear Lord. The good news of salvation. Father, this good news it is so good that it is extremely hard for us with our human heart to believe it. Dear Lord, I pray that you will give us a divine heart. That we will be able to comprehend the divine love that you loved us with. 
pray, dear Lord, that each and every one of us in here will truly give our hearts to Jesus. That what happened this morning will continue to happen in our days and in our lives every single day. Please, dear Lord, we pray. Help us not to be satisfied with what we have received. Let us help us to dig deeper so we can receive the blessings, the treasures that are in the storehouse of heaven that you are desiring to bless us with. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.